Uh, you're all very welcome tonight. My name is Jonathan McRae. I'm a broadcaster with Future Proof, and I, uh, I'm a science communicator, a trained scientist on how to communicate. And I'm delighted to welcome you once again to this very hallowed space for the FameLab National Final. Uh, if this is your first time, you're in for a treat. Uh, it's a very, very exciting evening. We have 10 uh, people who work in the area of science, technology, engineering, and maths. And what they've been tasked to do with is they've been asked to come up with a three-minute talk that will wow you, that will give you an insight into a particular scientific idea or topic, and they're going to do it with some flair, some charisma, and hopefully a little bit of comedy too. So uh, we're going to hear 10 talks, 10 contestants who have been honing their, their talks for you here tonight they're going to deliver, and they are going to be judged by our fantastic panelists. Um, I'll introduce you to those in a minute, but once we have selected a winner, that winner goes on um, to international fame, but also the international final at Cheltenham, which is a really special event. If you're into science, it's, it's not a, a far way to go. It's a beautiful science um, festival where you get to see some of uh, Britain's greatest science communicators talk and interact, and the final is on. It's a very, very um, highly respected event, and it's a it's a real thrill for whoever that person happens to be every year. So we're really looking forward to seeing how they get on in their journey. But there could be only one winner. And deciding that tonight are our panel of judges. Um, the judges will have uh, a few questions. Uh, then uh, after the 10 contestants, they go off and they, they do their deliberations and so on. Um, we're going to have the fantastic and, and adorable uh, Imre Maguire, uh, who's going to do some comedy music for us. She was a 2015 uh, UK FameLab uh, winner. Um, she's also a musician, and she's been, since winning, she's also um, done lots of stuff in the science communication space. Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to have our winners, and they're going to have uh, prizes be announced, and so on. So, without further ado, as they say, I'll introduce you to our esteemed panel. Uh, Sarita Johnston is a manager and fem uh, female entrepreneurship at Enterprise Ireland. Uh, as manager of female entrepreneurship, she manages Enterprise Ireland's key initiatives to support female entrepreneurs. And she has 20 years' experience in working with indigenous companies across multiple sectors. And she's a member of Network Ireland Ad Advisory Committee. And she even uh, so committed to innovation that she brought her son Kyle, who's seven. Uh, who she does mathletics with. We have no idea what that is, Sarita. I'm very, uh, very interested to find out. Uh, and, and this is clearly going to be a future fame labber here. You can see he's got his notepad and pen ready to take notes. <laughs> I asked him how many Easter eggs he's, he's got, and he said, I didn't have time to count. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to go back to? The seven-year-old, you don't have time to count your Easter eggs. <laughs> Um, our second panelist is Dr. Tim McCormick. He's head of research at Dundalk Institute of Technology. Uh, Tim is currently uh, a, a uh, well, he's head of research at Dundalk Institute of Technology. Um, <laughs> for some reason, I've written that twice. Um, he holds a BSc in Applied Science from Trinity College Dublin and a PhD in Physical Chemistry from D uh, DCU. Uh, his research interests uh, include sensor development for environmental monitoring and point of care biosensor. He's published over 50 peer reviewed publications within his field. He's a busy man. Uh, he has a keen interest in supporting young researchers. He's run a good few half Ironmans and he even sang in the Sydney Opera House. A man of many, many distinct talents. What did you sing? I can't remember, actually. Okay, not a great memory, but lots of talents. <laughs> Can't have it all, can you? Uh, our final panelist, you may recognise, Dr. Evie Nihulavon, is assistant professor at the School of Mathematics and Statistics in UCD. Um, she lectures on uh, mathematics, science, and education. She's a graduate of theoretical physics. Uh, she taught mathematics, physics, and applied maths before turning her focus to researching the teaching and learning of maths. She's mad about maths. <laughs> Evie is director of the Math Sparks program, engaging pupils in mathematical problem solving, and also is a science communicator on TV and radio, where she talks about about maths. Um, <laughs> however, you may not know this, she failed six year maths, which, you know, is an interesting thing to know. The She's Christmas also, test. huh? The Christmas, test. the Christmas test. Oh, you didn't say that. That's who cares about the Christmas test? I mean, no, sorry, if there are um, leaving certain people, that's really important. Your Christmas <laughs> test, so important. Okay. Well, I know, but like I, I thought, oh, this is, I thought maybe repeated that maybe it slipped someone a fiber. Um, she is also um, one of our country's greatest science communicators and uh, listed in the 40 under 40 European leaders representing Ireland. True, true. Right, so these are our judges. <laughs> Pretty good applause. I hope you at home who are watching the live stream are also applauding. We can hear you. Um, 
what we want for the, for the next 10 people who I announce on stage is a much bigger applause because what they're about to do is very, very nerve wracking. And some of you, I can see some former fame lovers in here just want, just here to enjoy the delicious discomfort of watching someone <laughs> squirm on stage for three minutes. Uh, it's a really, really difficult thing to do to distill a scientific concept that people probably haven't heard of into something uh, enjoyable, into something easy to understand, into something that inspires you. And that's what these people have tried to do. So please give uh, them all your biggest round of applause. <laughs> Our first speaker is Aaron Ridgway. Uh, he's a beer specialist at the Guinness Storehouse. Uh, Aaron acts as a spokesperson for a global brand delivering excitement and generating enthusiasm for a love of learning and teaching. Aaron likes to share the fascinating science behind daily life. He is currently a mature student in chemical science in UCD. He hopes to bring his passion for science to wider audiences, so uh, tick the box there. Uh, so I would like you please to raise your glasses and let Aaron pour you the perfect pint of science as he serves up his talk about the black stuff. No, not Guinness, space. <laughs> the death of a loved one affects us all deeply. As humans, we are bound by our connection to each other. And when that's severed, the grief can be real, powerful, and sometimes overwhelming. So I'd like to share with you through the science of light why for me I look to the stars to remember the ones that have gone before me. In 2003, we went on a family holiday to Tunisia in North Africa. Now if you've been on a sun holiday, you'll know that a lot of your time in the morning is spent strategically placing your towels before the other hotel guests to get to some sunbed superiority. My dad and I thought we had changed the game. We headed down in the middle of the night with our towels to secure some premium poolside real estate. I remember getting up to the pool and seeing how dark it was, or how bright it was, even though there was no lights on. And I remember looking up and going, whoa. For the first time in my life at 15 years old, I was looking at our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Like a fistful of diamonds had been thrown across a black canvas. Hundreds and thousands of pinpricks of light splitting the sky in two like a band. It was beautiful but I didn't understand the power of what I was experiencing right there. You see, light's fast. It's the fastest thing in the universe, traveling at over a billion kilometers an hour, or 299,792,485 meters per second. If you were traveling this speed, you'd spin around the equator of the planet seven and a half times every second. By contrast, it takes about eight hours in a commercial airplane to get halfway around the planet. Light is fast, but in the vast expanse of space, this only gets you so far. Light takes time to travel, just like an aeroplane. And we measure the distance it travels using light years, the amount it covers in one year through a vacuum. Everybody knows our nearest star? Hopefully. It takes eight minutes and 20 seconds for photons, particles of light, to get from the sun to Earth. This means that every time you look at the sun, which you should not do, you are in effect seeing it eight minutes and 20 seconds in the past. So each time you look at any of the stars, you are in essence traveling through time, and your eyes are the time machine. But this has a deeper meaning, ladies and gentlemen. We lost someone in our family recently, 71 years old. But there is a star, Kappa Fornicis, in the Fornax system, whose photons left their mother star when he was born, and are only now arriving to Earth. So we are connected to the stars in many ways, you are connected to your loved ones, not just by the light they give you in life, but you are connected to the light of the stars themselves and its journey through space and time. Thank you. Nicely done, very good. Uh, if you'd like to tweet, by the way, tweet all the way through this, hashtag is FameLab, uh, at um, uh, FameLab underscore Ireland is the handle. Uh, okay, it's time to turn to our judges. Uh, who would like to go first? Tim. Thanks very much, Aaron. It's very interesting. Um, I like the connection you had between humans, death, and space. Um, what do you hope to do in the future? Is this the field you're going into? Yes. In a, in a word, <laughs> yes. Um, I've spent seven years working for Guinness as a communicator, making people excited about beer, 
<laughs> Hard job? Tough job. <laughs> <laughs> really have to work a room. Um, and the more that I communicated to people, the more stories I told, the more that I made people passionate about what I was talking about, the more I really desired to make people care about the things that were important to me. And I think more than ever, I think everyone in this room can agree that there is a great need for an understanding in science right now. I went back to college after a failed first attempt when I was 22. I dropped out of college in genetics and cell biology. I went to work for a few years, but I never lost my love of science. And I've been given the platform now to stand here in front of you and talk about science. And that's really why I'm here and what I hope to do. Yeah. Great. OK. <laughs> Evie loved that answer. Uh, well, I do, because I think it's actually really important that we talk about our failures as well as our successes. Mm. So well done dropping out when it wasn't the right course for you, and exactly. well done for coming back when you're interested in Thank it. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, and what I wanted to ask you specifically about it is, how did you find out, and I'm also <coughs> sorry to hear about your loss, but how did you find out about that star? How did you locate that? I mean, is that something that you just Googled, or where did you go for that information? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, in terms of time dilation and the, the, the amount of time it takes for stars, uh, it, it was basically a search. Um, it's a fantastic website called Solnet, and it keeps a category of stars within 100 light years of Earth. So you can all find your star, actually. You can all find your star that will tell you when those photons left that star and when it arrives at your current age, which is pretty amazing. Um, I came up with the talk because um, my, my girlfriend's here tonight. Um, it was her uncle that passed away. And we were all, when, we, when they arrived home from the United States, uh, we were standing in the garden looking at the sky in the dark. And it, they just seemed to connect. Thank you. Thanks. Karen, um, you're a lovely storyteller. You <laughs> Thank know, you. I was there with you looking at the stars and wondering whether I'd get the pitch by the pool. <laughs> but, you know, where is this going to take you? Are you going to be an educator? Are you going to do more research? Where do you see this taking you? For me, um, again, it's to do, I suppose, with inspiring others. Um, I may not be at that level right now. I'm at the beginning of my academic career in terms of the scientific community. But what I value is the ability to inspire in other people. And I think that's something that's lost about teachers is that teachers inspire people to do better than themselves in some ways. Um, and I, I think that's really where I see myself. I'm able to tell a story, and I have been telling stories for a long time, but if I manage to inspire someone to do better than me, then that's how I know I'll win. All right, give it up please for Aaron Ridgway. <laughs> Our next frame labber is Marika Casarino. Uh, uh, Italian Marika has studied cognitive psychology and psychobiology, and she recently completed her PhD in applied psychology in UCC, exploring which places in Ireland support better cognitive functioning in adult age. She's hoping her talk will be one we all remember for years to come, even the approximately 16 of you who are statistically speaking likely to develop dementia by the age of 65. <laughs> Please uh, welcome Marika Casarino, whose talk is Curiosity Didn't Really Kill the Cat. Marika Casarino, please. is my one-year-old boy's first encounter with a tiger at a wildlife park, spellbound, visibly curious to know more about that unfamiliar animal. Who hasn't felt the thrill of discovering something new? An intriguing book, an inspiring person, a foreign city, a recent scientific breakthrough. New experiences like those help us to learn about the world, but I'm here to reveal the secret of how they also make our brain age slower. The keys to that secret are a tiny blue nucleus deep inside our brain called locus ceruleus and a microscopic chemical, noradrenaline. Locus ceruleus is in charge of capturing novel events in the environment. And when that happens, it secretes noradrenaline to wake the brain up. 
helping us to focus our attention on the situation, use past experiences to understand it, and form a new memory of it. Now, in dangerous or stressful situations, Logos Aurelius gets overwhelmed and doesn't work well. Instead, with positive stimulating experiences, it releases a lot of noradrenaline, which in turn helps neurons to connect, to form new connections, strengthen their connection, so promoting learning. So the more noradrenaline, the more the brain exercises and gets strong, like a muscle. But noradrenaline works also as a rejuvenating treatment. It cleans toxins, inflammation or other threats off neurons, protecting the brain from pathologies such as Alzheimer's disease. For example, if a little mouse grows up in a cage which offers stimulating objects, so tunnels, wheels, toys, in all the rage, its brain will have more noradrenaline and less neuropathology than that of a mouse growing up in a barren cage. So the more noradrenaline, the healthier the aging brain. And this is thanks to environmental stimulation. Of course, genes have an important role on how we age. However, studies on identical twins, that is, with the same genetic characteristics, have shown that if one twin receives more education than the other, he or she will have a lower risk of developing dementia. Education, trying different hobbies, meeting new friends, keep Locus Aurelius busy with novel learning opportunities. They are noradrenaline boosters, and over time, they train the brain to build up what scientists call cognitive reserve, that is, resilience to age-related diseases. We can increase our cognitive reserve by being curious like children and seeking new ways to stimulate our brain. Curiosity didn't really kill the cat. It fed its brain on noradrenaline, keeping it healthy and strong for longer. Thank you. Nice job, Marika. And so we turn to our judges. Sirita. Marcia, thank you very much. Um, that was extremely interesting. What I'd like to know is, what can I do as a normal person that doesn't have a scientific background? Is it do jigsaws? Is it do puzzles? Or, you know, what can I do to improve the neuroadrenaline in my brain? To, and can, can, by doing puzzles and whatever, does that help me build up my, me, my brain memory so to alleviate against a, you know, memory loss in later life? Yes, so there are several activities that we can do. So even the small changes in our lifestyle. Uh, we go from playing games, so like examples that you, were, that you were bringing, but also doing sports, having an active lifestyle, just go for a brisk walk, or meeting friends, going to our neighbors and have a chat about the news. Those experiences expose us to novel information. We learn something new. And they help our brain to basically exercise and get strong, be, be resilient basically to, to aging. And uh, so there, it's really small, small changes. We don't need to do great, great things. And uh, I kind of forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> OK, thank you. Sorry about that. I found that really interesting because you chose a topic that obviously is very current and it is a big problem coming down the track. Is there a difference between men and women with this problem, do you think? No. For example, the, study that, the, stu the studies on identical twins that I quoted found no difference between men and women. So I think it's really down to trying new things that we would like to try and gender doesn't, doesn't really matter. So far, the evidence, the, the studies say that there, there are no differences. Marie, oh, you. Time for another one? Yes, uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Marika. I really enjoyed that as well. Could you tell us more about learning? Because I think this is something that maybe we, we don't know enough about, that it's really about, is it establishing better links between the neurons? Yes, yes. When, when we learn, we basically push brain areas such, for example, hippocampus, where the memories are formed, to, um, to create new links between existing neurons or to strengthen existing links. So this way the brain gets basically more flexible, it becomes more plastic, and better able to, um, to deal and to respond to, the dem to environmental demands. So it's really a strengthening of networks inside the brain. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Marika Casarino. <laughs> Our next speaker.
is Shane Brown. His talk is called Beer's Law. Shane graduated in biomedical science at NUI Galway with a focus on molecular biology. He went on to gain experience in academic research and clinical research before going back to work in the domain of genomics in Limerick. He enjoys the four C's, comedy, competition, conversation, and cats, uh, which is great because at least three of those are a requisite for success here at FameLab. He is feline confident. Please welcome Shane Brown. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to be here. The focal point for today's presentation will be Beer's Law. Uh, that's right, there's a scientific law solely dedicated to booze. And furthermore, a predominant theme will be chocolate tasting. Who doesn't love chocolate, right? In a nutshell, I hope to use my knowledge of biomedical science to provide you all with an insight into how medical professionals exploit color in order to identify the presence of biomarkers in a patient's blood. And this is for diagnosis. Okay, so Beer's Law. Beer's Law effectively explains that chemical concentration is proportional to color intensity. It may sound complicated, but interestingly, the vast majority of the audience here today are acutely aware of its significance. Take, for instance, the very popular cordial Ribena. Everyone knows the more Ribena you pour into a liter of water, the more concentrated the solution is. It tastes stronger, right? Similarly, everyone knows the more, more Ribena you pour into a liter of water, the more intense the color of the solution. These two factors are not random correlation, Rather, Beer's Law implies that chemical concentration and color intensity are an example of causation. The take home message for Beer's Law, the more intense the color, the more concentrated the solution. So I want to find a practical application of Beer's Law, specifically spectrophotometry. Try saying that word after you've had a few drinks, nightmare. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm a total foodie, as my friends will attest to, and it just so happens that I'm also a chocolate connoisseur, with dark chocolate being my favorite. If I use the ever popular out of 10 scale, I would give dark chocolate a 10 out of 10. Similarly, with regards to milk chocolate, I'm rather indifferent. I mean, I'll eat it if there's nothing else lit in the house, so I give it a 5 out of 10. And finally, I don't care for white chocolate, so I give it an abysmal 1 out of 10. Now, with this reference chocolate scale in mind, I want you to imagine the following scenario. One of my friends comes up to me, and he's bouncing off the walls. He tells me, Shane, I've discovered a completely new chocolate, and I want you to be the first to try it. Well, <laughs> naturally I'm going to be excited. This is right up my alley after all. However, in this circumstance, I'm just after a five course meal and I literally can't fit any more food in me. So I'm forced to decline. But as I'm declining, I start to wonder, what does that chocolate taste like? <laughs> so I take a brief visual inspection. I see the chocolate is slightly darker than milk chocolate, but not quite dark enough to be considered dark chocolate. Therefore, I can instinctively estimate that cho the chocolate taste will rank somewhere on my scale between five out of 10 and 10 out of 10. And this is based solely off its color, okay? Put simply, we use the, co the color intensity of controls to directly construct a reference range, and then from this we make inferences about the unknown concentration of chemicals based solely off the color intensity. In fact, just last year in clinical research, I applied Beer's Law and spectrophotometry to estimate the concentration of pro-insulin in human serum, and uh, this was used to, to monitor patients who are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So, um, <clears throat> one final thing before I finish my presentation. I previously referenced that I don't care for white chocolate. Is there anyone here who disagrees and would like to take it off my hands? <laughs> you have a taker. Thank you. Well done, Shane. All right, over to our judges. I was going to ask you about the chocolate. This, you're this going is not. To share it round, actually. But, uh, the dark chocolate. I'm pretty sure it's against the rules. <laughs> sure. Um, just in terms, you mentioned diabetes. Is there any other diseases that you're looking at in your research? Uh, several. So I worked in infectious diseases. So my primary uh, disease will be uh, TB, HIV, and then hepatitis. But the one that I used Beer's Law for was pro-insulin. Uh, interestingly, you can predict, based off the ratio of pro-insulin to insulin, how likely someone is to develop type 2 diabetes. And as you can imagine, it's much better to be able to prevent than to treat. Mm -hmm. So. Evie? Um, well done, Shane, because uh, when you're talking about your own research as well, I think it's, it's really difficult. And so well done for getting yourself back on track there, because that's a difficult thing to do live, streaming, with big audience and everything. So well done for that. Can you tell me more about pro-insulin? Because this sounds really interesting. OK, so pro-insulin is a precursor to insulin. And what happens with type 2 diabetes is you have insulin resistance, and you can't get the glucose into the cells. The glucose builds up in the bloodstream, and you've got problems. You can have problems with your kidneys, problems with your eyes. So interestingly, one of the first signs is you'll have, I believe, a higher pro-insulin than insulin. 
that you should have it equal. So, you can, uh, so when you calculate the concentration of pro-insulin, you have a marker, you see it's much higher than the insulin in the body, and you're kind of going, hang on, get this patient in, tell them to adjust their lifestyle, and hopefully everything will be okay. Great, thank you, Shane. Shane Brown, everyone. <laughs> Our next speaker is Deirdre Robertson. Uh, her talk is called Control, Alt, Delete, Unfreezing the Brain. Uh, Deirdre is a postdoctoral researcher in psychology uh, right here in Trinity College in the Institute of Neuroscience. She investigates how our minds affect our bodies and what this means for health. Uh, Deirdre spent a year working as a postdoctoral researcher in Columbia University, but we're happy to have her back here in Ireland. She believes uh, in the power of scientific research to inform policy and make positive changes to people's lives. As I said, her talk is called Control, Alt, Delete, Unfreezing the Brain. Let's hope she doesn't get the blue screen of death as uh, Deirdre gives us a cursory talk on neuroscience. So I probably won't be jogging out with the senior hurling team anytime soon. To be honest, if you'd asked me who was the best person to have played Croke Park in recent years, I'd probably have said Beyonce. <laughs> but what I can tell you is how understanding my clumsy hurling skills can help us to develop treatments for Parkinson's disease. First, imagine this. You're standing at your front door, ready to go in, when suddenly you can't move. Your feet feel glued to the floor. Freezing is one of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and it can happen without warning. We didn't know why or how to fix it until recently, when psychologists made a fascinating discovery about how to unfreeze the brain. So the part of the brain that controls movement is the motor cortex up here, and it controls two programs that deal with two types of movements, those that are focused on goals and those that are automatic. It's like learning to drive, do you remember the first time it was so difficult? You're steering the wheel, pressing the accelerator, changing gear. But now, do you even notice? No, your brain is on autopilot. When I picked up this hurl, my motor cortex switched on the program responsible for movements that we have to focus on for goals. It received a ton of information about where to put my hands and where to put my feet. But what if instead we gave this hurl to Henry Shefflin? Because he has done this movement, thousands of times. He no longer needs all of that input. His brain just switches on the autopilot program, meaning that he could probably continue this conversation while effortlessly flicking that ball up into the back stands and probably breaking your nose. Sorry. But what does this mean for freezing in Parkinson's disease? Well, the brain can sometimes act like a computer with one program broken and the other one working. In Parkinson's disease, the part of the brain that starts to break down is that responsible for the autopilot program. What the psychologists discovered was that if they simply put a line on the ground or rolled a ball in front of the person who was frozen, they would be able to start walking again. Why? Because the line and the ball act as a visual goal for the brain. It's essentially like pressing Control-Alt-Delete on your computer. It tells the brain to ignore the broken autopilot system and instead to restart the system focused on goals, therefore allowing them to walk again. So research like this shows that by examining the complex networks of the human brain, we can start to understand and develop new treatments to help the symptoms of Parkinson's disease that don't respond so well to medication. And that's because the brain, just like a hurling team, usually has a sub on the sidelines ready to take over if the star player gets injured. Deirdre Robinson, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Over to our judges. Deirdre, thank you for that. Um, I have a lot of interest in this particular space, and I would have worked with Beats Medical yeah. and uh, Kira within that company. And also, I know there's other um, research coming out of Galway, NUIG. The opportunities and the business opportunities in this particular space are, are vast and yeah. great. And you know, you're at a great time. What 
you, you mentioned that you want to look at policy and influence in policy. Yeah. But what about the business opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I should say that this isn't my area. It's just something that I'm absolutely fascinated by. So fascinated by. Um, but there are, as you say, a huge number of businesses who are taking this up, and it's great to have businesses that can make such an impact on people's lives. There is one thing which is that. This is relatively recent. The idea of putting the line down, for example, is um, quite well known, but the understanding behind it is relatively recent. So there's some people who it works really well for, and there's some people who it doesn't. And at the moment, we're trying to figure out what are the mediating mechanisms of that. So there was a paper recently, so Beats Medical uses auditory um, goals, so it's like a metronome ticking or music or hearing footsteps. And uh, the researchers in this paper found that it depended on people's ability to count beats, whether that affected their brain or not. So there's all these individual differences as well that predict it. And I think the more that we study these networks and the more we find those individual differences, the more opportunities there are for business, particularly with you know, the ability of our smartphones to determine huge amounts of things about us. So yeah, it's, it's an amazing realm. Thanks, Deirdre. I really enjoyed that presentation. And great to, to learn about the re that research, which I hadn't heard about before. So I want to ask you a question, and I hope it's not too difficult to one. But when we usually think about science, we are usually thinking about um, the, the, the life sciences. And you're talking to us about the, the psychology. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit more about maybe how we should be blending those fields? Or do you see them as distinct? No, uh, like my, my thing is that I think they're absolutely combined. And I think it's so important as well to consider, you know, in psychology, often we think about behaviors and we think about thoughts and stuff like that. And then in, say, biology, you might think about the immune system or about cortisol. And it's such an important area to consider the two and to consider how the mind affects the body. And it's in situations like these, which I think this really came from a rehabilitation perspective rather than from the science perspective. And now it's going back to figure out what's happening and I think we have you know we talk about new frontiers in terms of space and stuff but I think the brain is a hugely untapped new frontier that in you know coming decades we're going to just find out more and more about what influences and it might not always be the things that we we realize and that we think the start so I think the mind body connection is so important and only getting more so. Deirdre Robertson everyone <laughs> nice job Our next speaker is Patrick Ryan. Uh, he started his career in science with an undergraduate degree from NUI Galway, after which he did a short stint in industry, and it involved data analysis until so Pat decided he wanted to get into bioinformatics. Uh, he then followed this up with a PhD in genetics here in Trinity, working on gene expression in developing flowers. He is currently back in NUI Galway studying evolution of plant genes as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, keen on STEM, he's branching uh, out, taking part in fame. I'm here tonight, so please, Clora, fill the room with noise. <laughs> For a Flora Adora, Pat Ryan. <laughs> This is what a fig looks like if you make it out of paper mache for less than a fiver. Now, the idea for this talk came from a conversation I had with a friend of mine who was vegetarian and refused to eat a fig roll on the basis that figs can contain wasps. And I thought that this was a bit mad, but being a scientist, I said I'd look into it before I pass judgment. And I'm glad I did, because it turns out figs are actually incredibly interesting. For one thing, this is not technically a fruit. This is a structure called a cyconium, which is a pod that totally encloses both the flowers and the fruit of a fig. And it's an important distinction to make. Because of the cyconium, the flowers of a fig are not open to pollinators like bees and like the wind or whatever the normal one would be. Instead, figs have an obligate mutualism with a family of wasps. Now, mutualism in biology is exactly what it sounds like. It's when two different species have a mutually beneficial relationship. But if you've ever looked inside of a fig, you won't have seen a wasp. You'll have seen all of these pink little strands in a jelly. And the jelly is the fruit. And the strands are the female flowers. Because figs are one of the few trees that are actually both male and female on separate plants. And in order to find a wasp, you have to look inside of a male fig. And you can probably tell I had great fun making this over the weekend. <laughs> but uh, the wasps live their entire lives inside of the male fig, except for the female, who once she's mature, will fly away to try and find another fig to live in and to have her babies just stick that there. <laughs> now, 
Here's where things get a little bit tricky for her because she's just lived her entire life inside of a male flower and is covered in pollen. So the fig wants her to go inside of a female one and pollinate it. And from the outside, the poor wasp can't tell the difference. So she has to roll the dice. And if she's lucky, she'll get a male fig and she'll be able to lay her eggs inside it and life will continue for her. But if she's unlucky, she'll get the female fig. And she'll spend the rest of her life crawling around inside it trying to lay her eggs and pollinating the flowers. And that's going to activate the fig to develop its fruit and release an enzyme called physin, which digests the wasp. So you'll never find a wasp inside of a fig because figs eat wasps. <laughs> and that's a crazy life cycle. But it's one that's remarkably successful for both the figs and the wasps because there's over 750 species of fig. And the vast majority of them have at least one wasp that only pollinates it. And Evolutionary biologists have been able to trace back the family trees of both figs and wasps back 60 million years. And they think that this mutualism arose only once in all of history uh, as a random encounter. And I think it's very interesting to think about what those ancient figs and the fig wasps might have looked like. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that they weren't made out of pipe cleaners. Thank you very much. Well done, Pat. <laughs> Judges. So Patrick, thanks very much. Did your friend eat the fig roll in the end? Or... <laughs> no, they didn't. No. But I've had conversations with other uh, vegetarians and vegans about this as well, and most of them will eat figs because it's, it's not really against their ethics because it's just part of the life cycle of the fig. It's not anything they can do anything about. But as well as that, most of the figs that we actually eat would be parthenocarpic and don't need to be pollinated to produce fruit. So um, ones, if you had your ones that grow in your own back garden, because we don't have the wasps here in Ireland, as far as I know. Um, if they get fruit from them, you can eat them and be sure that there's no wasps in it. And just um, where do you hope to go with your career? When you're I'd like to stay in research and I'd like to keep going, but I'd also like to move into more uh, science communication as I do it, because I think it's something that's important for uh, established academics to do more of and to make more of an effort to communicate our research uh, to the wider audience and get out kind of outside of the university. You know? Thanks for that, Patrick. Um, just in relation to you know evolution and plant genes and where that takes us to, are the applications in science or there, where are the applications in layman terms? Oh, there's applications everywhere. Um, I mean, one of the big ones is uh, because a lot of fruit that we eat is parthenocarpic, they're not reproducing sexually, so they're not evolving disease resistance. So we'll be able to kind of genetically engineer disease resistance into plants that might not have it. Uh, and that's a big thing, because like, there's a lot of uh, diseases that affect fruit crops, uh, potatoes, wheat, everything has something, you know? Thank you. Okay. Patrick Ryan, everyone. Yes. Our next speaker is Will Knott. Uh, his uh, talk is called Raise a Glass. Uh, Will is a bag of surprises. Uh, with a background in applied mathematical sciences and opera, uh, Will went on to work in telecommunications, software security, and digital media streaming. He's been involved in the maker community in arts and is currently maker in chief for Tyndall, creating prototypes and demonstrations. During the masterclass weekend, which we did a few weeks ago, a drag queen saved his life. I've not yet heard this story, though. <laughs> he may tell us after he tells us this one. Ladies and gentlemen, fans and trans, please put your hands together for Will Not. Words have power. Words like cost, like price, like ishkabaha. It's the Irish for whiskey. It translates as the water of life, which may be apt because whiskey may actually have the key to saving the planet. But let's start with water. If you blast the molecule with enough electricity, you split it apart into oxygen and hydrogen, which will save for later. Now, to do that, there's a cost, the energy to split this molecule. But if you use something like a solar panel to provide the electricity, the cost trends towards free. Words have power, but cost and price have two very different meanings. So what do we do with the hydrogen? Well, not much at the moment. I mean, we can use it to generate uh, hydrogen fuel cells, but we're not really using them. So let's save that for later. Because 
I love the idea that a crowd of students from U University College Cork's Energy Re sorry, Environmental Research Institute went to Middleton with the distillery and said, can we have some? Oh, Anas discovered a question. Now, when you make whiskey, you distill it. But before that, you ferment the barley with yeast to go and release the alcohol and the flavor. Now, this fermentation process releases a large amount of really clean CO2, carbon dioxide. Normally, you just vent it in the atmosphere. But let's capture that. If you mix your hydrogen with your CO2, you get H2O and CH4. That's water and methane, or natural gas. OK, this time it's synthetic natural gas. But there is a cost. Now, a nickel uh, catalyst will help, but you need to go and heat your gases up to around 450 degrees centigrade for them to get together to make methane. Otherwise, any breath you take could potentially be lung blowing. But this cost, if you use solar power, to, um, to solar power, wind turbines, you can electrically generate the heat required and you can generate your methane cleanly. So the technologies are causing the cost to remain the same, but the price to go down. So what do we do with this methane? What do we do with synthetic natural gas? We burn it. And after off going to all that trouble, why on earth go and burn it? Because when you burn it in a natural gas power station, you generate electricity. Because you see, renewable technologies have a cost. The sun doesn't always shine. Night. Wind doesn't always blow. And when you get spikes, you just have to dissipate it because battery technology isn't there yet. Using this method, you can go and save the energy. You can go and otherwise you need to have your backup generators working all the time. This gives you a fuel to keep them going, which means you're using a waste product from the food industry rather than growing biofuels, which means we don't have to dig up donating resources, which means the planet can breed. And words of power, like cost and price and hope. So let's raise a glass. Well done, everyone. Over to you, gang. Um, that was really interesting, is it, sorry? Uh, but uh, I'm not great at chemistry. So can you tell me, how can you save this energy in order to use it at times where we, we, we mightn't have other energy to use? It's a bit like recharging a battery. It's a difficult chem chemical process. And I will point out I'm actually more physics than chemistry, so I'm slightly <laughs> worrying this myself. Um, the method is you are changing from one, chemical, uh, one molecule to another by combining everything together. So you're turning your carbon dioxide, CO2, and your uh, hydrogen, H2, into, well, obviously you need more, but water and methane. The water you can let back again or go and filter out for later separation. But the methane is just a gas. So you've got gas tanks filling up in the same way that you've got cows filling up with methane. Um, and but however, this gas is ready to use immediately because it is the same ga natural gas that you actually use in your, in your gas-powered fuel stations, power stations. Anyone else? Yeah. Tim? Um, just in terms of, you mentioned the splitting of water, is that the way to go in terms of solving the energy crisis? It's A. There are lots of different ways to go at the moment. However, we do have the impending 2020 limits coming up and the harsher 2030 limits coming up. So it's something that could be possible to use. And even if when battery technology does get there, methane itself is a feeder chemical, meaning that you can go and generate longer polycarbon chains. Uh, we're going to need plastics. Even though never mind petroleum, we are going to need plastics. Um, so it, does, it means that we don't have to keep digging up from the resources that are dwindling away. There is a way to renew this. And goodness knows we have enough CO2 at the moment out there. Well done, everyone. Thanks, Phil. All right, our next speaker is Anna Panagassi. Uh, she's from Brazil. Uh, she's an Obgine who has specialized in maternal fetal medicine. Uh, now she's a fellow at BioInnovate Ireland in anyway, Galway. And uh, innovation in healthcare is her new gig. Um, she has lots of interests, including quizzes and watching too much TV. But don't be fooled by her warm and friendly personality. She's no pushover. Uh, before she was a doctor for Lady Bits, uh, Anna was also in the military police. Uh, so mind your manners. Uh, the baton is now passed to fame Lambert number seven. Brace yourselves and cause a riot for Anna Panigasi. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Jonathan. So 
Hi, I'm the stork, basically. Yeah, uh, but the thing is uh, uh, about dealing with pregnant peoples is that everybody thinks they're a bit of a specialist, you know what I mean? Like, when you're pregnant, uh, people will touch her belly unannounced, right? And they'll give you information in your own pregnancy, like, oh, you're too big for five months, are you sure it isn't twins? And, you're like, ah. and that's like your morning commute to work on the bus. So yeah, not an easy life. Anyway, uh, the thing is, because of that, some people tend to think that I'm not very important, not necessarily required. The baby will come, you just catch it. <laughs> that kind of stuff, yeah. But anyway, the thing is, I am very important, not because I'm a doctor and I say so, but I'm very important because not only I can tell you what's going on, well, most of the time, but I can also predict the future. Not in a crystal ball-y, horoscope -y kind of way, but I can do that with science. So when you're a tiny little embryo, 12 weeks old, uh, which means you can fit here on half a business card, uh, using an ultrasound machine, I check a bunch of stuff. So first of all, I check your little head, your belly, your little arms, your little legs, that's called your morphology. And then I measure a bunch of stuff. For example, I measure the back of your neck, that's called the nuchal translucency, and it can give me tons of information from if your heart is functioning properly to the likelihood of you having an extra chromosome. And to that, I add a bunch of blood tests. So I look for biochemical markers. And the coolest thing I can do, on week nine, I can find the DNA of a single cell of yours that has escaped to your mammy's bloodstream, and I can do the genetic sequencing of that cell. So you add all of that, uh, the ultrasound, the blood, the works, and I can tell a bunch of stuff from that. So I can tell you for sure that your abdomen and your skull are properly closed. I can look for a particular gene for a rare disease, or I can tell the likelihood of your mammy's blood pressure uh, spiking at the end of the pregnancy. That means that today, I can give personalized care to pregnant women since the beginning of their pregnancy, throughout their pregnancy, and I can do serious prevention over intervention. So that's why, my friends, I'm not just a goal keeper for catching babies, <laughs> or a baby photographer with an ultrasound, or a deliveroo, as one of my friends says. <laughs> yes, what I do, my friends, is I truly deliver. Thank you. <laughs> All right, judges. Hi, Anna. Thanks Hi. for that. Um, very, very interesting. I wish my seven-year-old stayed to actually hear that. <laughs> but, okay, serious prevention against intervention. Prevention, explain to me. All I know is I was pregnant, I had a baby, and I wasn't worried. My husband was worried about different things. Yes. And, you know, I, was, I basically lived in a cloud nine for, for nine months, and then reality took over. So just tell me about the prevention. What can you prevent? So uh, the beautiful thing about all of this that I just told you, that it's got so much bigger in the last five years that you probably had, didn't get there uh, on your pregnancy seven years ago. So uh, what I can do, for example, I can look for any kind of genetic disease using your blood. I don't have to uh, do invasive procedures, use big needles, go inside the womb. Uh, I can do prevention for preeclampsia. There's loads of study, studies going on now about the use of aspirin in the first trimester to prevent preeclampsia. They're going very well. So, uh, and not only that, I can give information. And when you're pregnant, as you say so, you live on cloud, like on the clouds, whatever, what's going to happen. And there's nothing <coughs> better than the truth in your hands. So, yeah, I'm very happy for all that, yeah. Great. Anna, thank you so much. Uh, we don't actually hear the medicine side in STEM communication very often. So um, you taught us loads there, and I want to ask you, why did you decide to join um, this science communication event? Well, I was strong-armed into it. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I've, always been, I've always been a medical tutor after I finished school, so I trained residents of all since the first year to uh, high-level residents. I, I always love to do that, and I, I, I have the habit of talking to patients 
like that as well because I truly believe patients deserve to know what's going on. So um, uh, Fame Lab was a huge opportunity for me, and I love the stage. So it was a great <laughs> opportunity to do it on the stage. So. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to have to get off the stage now, everybody. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anna Panagetti. Time flies, doesn't it? We're all we're, we're blaming through. So we're on uh, speaker number eight. Our fame labber next is Rob Cross. His talk is called Black Magic, the Physics Behind Guinness. Having previously studied uh, applied physics at the University of Limerick, Rob hopes to complete uh, MSc in statistics in the future. Probability quite high on that one. Uh, he has loved science from a young age and is chairperson and speaking coach of the UL Science Society. Rob also hosts his own radio show on UL FM and is interested in politics and writes poetry. So do I. Roses are red, <laughs> violets are blue, you clap for everyone else, you might as well clap for Rob too. Slantia, I'd like to take you back to when I started college doing applied physics. We had a lovely module in first year just called measurements. Measurements, that, that was it. And what would you think we'd study in that? Bubbles. Bubbles for six weeks. I know more about bubbles now than I ever thought I would in my life. And by the end of that, I just put it to the back of my head and thought, well, I'm never going to use that again ever. And I was thinking that too, but when I was trying to work out what talk I do here, I was in the pub and, you know, one of the guys said, am I polluted or are the bubbles actually going down in my Guinness instead of up? The two things clicked and I thought, why don't I look into that? So, first of all, we need a pint of Guinness. And here's one I prepared earlier. Now, this worked in practice, so I'm hoping this works. Yeah, that's, oh yeah, there we go, that's fine. Uh, so, bubbles in Guinness are actually quite interesting. The difference between Guinness uh, compared to several other drinks is they're actually brewed with nitrogen, not just CO2. And that makes a very, very big difference, you see. Yeah, it'll probably be fine. Um, there we go. The, using nitrogen causes a different uh, pressure in the bubbles and them to react differently. The bubbles actually are going up. But if you look at this point quite closely, you'll see they're actually, looks like they're going down. What's happening there is the bubbles are going up, they're hit, interacting with the head, and the head has actually forced them to the side. It's actually the shape of the glass itself. Uh, this is called a tulip glass, so this kind of a shape. So think of Kim Kardashian doing a handstand, you'll get the kind of shape <laughs> idea there. It's that kind of shape that you need for the bubbles to actually go down. And then they basically continue to cycle and go back up again. The reason that the head is so creamy here, but I know this is a shockingly poor point of Guinness, so I apologize. I'm so sorry, Aaron. I wasn't allowed to bring an entire pub on stage. Hopefully for the future, we'll try that again. But it's because of the, if we go back to what we learned probably in science class, PV is equal to NRT, the ideal gas law, the pressure and the volume are inversely proportional to each other. So the pressure in the bubbles um, uh, affects the volume of the head inversely. So that's how that is formed. But you might hear something here. There you can hear better now. There's a little ball at the bottom of that. It's called a Guinness widget, and it's very like a ping pong ball. Basically, in order to get a head like this on a point outside of a pub, you have to use a little bit of a trick. It's kind of like, in order to get the bubbles going to this, you have to drop in this widget with a little hole in it, with a drop of liquid nitrogen before the beer goes into it. This gives it a bit of a kick start when you open up the can. It actually fires a jet of Guinness out of this, which sounds class, uh, which, gets the which gets the bubbles going. Because the bubbles in this are a bit like a doctor on United Airlines flight. They need a bit of encouragement to get going. <laughs> See, I can be very topical. <laughs> and that causes the head to be poured perfectly. So before I leave you, I leave you with a bit of prose by the great Flann O'Brien. When things go, Things go wrong and will not come right, but you do the best you can. When things look black as a night itself, a point of plane is your only man. Slant you. Okay. Rob, thank you. I, I love drinking Guinness, and it's always good to find out more about it. Jonathan's not like, but. <laughs> um, so you studied bubbles for six weeks. And yes. I have loads of questions that I want to ask you now. But <laughs> one question that I'd like is, did you find out any other interesting things about bubbles and where they're useful in the world around us? Um, yeah, it was at, when I was doing applied physics in UL, it was very much catered towards doing kind of uh, stuff with semiconductors down the thing. 
down the line. So having knowledge of bubbles like that to stop them coming in the process when you're actually treating the silicon wafer, sla wafer, there's the word wafer. Sorry, I've had a couple of those as prep. <laughs> um, when you get those in the process, so having a knowledge of how bubbles work and how they react and the fluid mechanics behind them is very important in doing that, so you don't have to ruin a chip of silicon and try again. So that's why it would become relevant to what I was doing. Great, thank you. Oh, there you go. And I'll ask another question if nobody else is going to ask another question. Um, so, <laughs> so apart from having our little widget in the can, yep. and that's how it happens in the can, can you explain to us how it would work at a bar? Uh, in a bar, the nitrogen is actually being used to pour the Guinness. You're going to see Guinness taps do look a bit different. Uh, it's, they're being poured at nitrogen instead of just CO2. There is a bit of CO2 in them with the bubbles, but it's mostly because of that. Um, it, basically, in a bar, it's like the widget, but it takes a much longer time. And that's going to why you let it settle halfway through and do that, so the bubbles will have a chance to get nucleating, getting up and down, and then you fill it up again. But as an example as well, if you actually have a bottle again, it's the widget's actually in the neck of the bottle instead, so it, does, it works a bit differently. So my brother, who's a barman, told me that it was just a myth that you had to wait to let the Guinness stand. You actually don't have to, in this very strict sense. It's kind of a promotional thing, but th you do there's a slight difference in taste, in my opinion. <laughs> I did a lot of research for this talk, and I tried a lot of Guinness, just to be sure. <laughs> the things I do for science. Um, but I think it is a slight issue with taste, but it's also personal preference as well. Okay, thank so, you very much. Round of applause, everyone. Our, penult our penultimate famed lover is Ross Murphy. His talk is, what does it mean to be you? Uh, despite setting off his school's fire alarm in a chemistry experiment, Ross somehow managed to make it all the way to Trinity College Dublin, uh, where he is in his third year of a biochemistry degree. Uh, he enjoys applying scientific knowledge to philosophical problems and questioning the world around us. In his spare time, Ross says he enjoys reading, drawing, and convincing people he can pull off a moustache or a beard. Uh, let's hope he can convince you he can pull off a science talk. Her suited and booted, here he is. Come on down. Oh, come on, don't remember the last bit. Wait till I'm finished. Come on down, Ross Murphy. It's a pretty good broom, isn't it? We've had it for about 20 years. And just like Trigger from Only Fills and Horses, in that time, this broom has had about 10 new heads and 10 new handles. The question, of course, is, is it really the same broom? But we can ask this about ourselves as well. So the human body is changing every single day. This means that are we still the same person we were yesterday? Your body is made up of cells. These are tiny biological machines which help to give you structure, take in nutrients, give out energy, and generally help to keep you alive. But since I've started speaking, 100 million of your cells have now died. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Your cells are constantly undergoing a cycle of growth and death. <coughs> New cells are formed in a process called mitosis. This is where the cell replicates its DNA, elongates, and then splits into two new cells. But the opposite process is also happening. Any unhealthy or damaged cells will collapse, condense, and then are taken away by cells of the immune system and degraded. What this means is, as you're sitting here, the physical makeup of your body is changing. And this balance between cell growth and cell death is very important. Too much death leads to atrophy. Too much growth leads to cancer. If you held someone's hand even one month ago, all of the skin cells on their hand have now been shed and replaced with completely new cells. So if you held their hand today, are you holding the same hand or a different hand? There's a commonly thrown around fact that the human body replaces all of its cells every seven years. But this isn't strictly true. At age 25, you replace 1% of your cardiac muscle cells every year. At age 70, this goes down to half a percent. This means that even in people who've lived a very long life, they still have half their original muscle cells in their heart. This means as you're sitting here right now, there are cells inside you that have been there since you first learned to ride a bike, since you had your first kiss, and since your mother held you in her arms and looked into your eyes for the first time. We are more than just a broom with a new head. 
Yes, there are parts of us that are permanent, that are temporary, but in our hearts, there's a part of us that's permanent. Thank you for listening. Baby geek, give me every time. <laughs> Ross, um, Ross Murphy, what do you think, Judges? Ross, um, in your bio here, you, you, you talk about convincing people that you can pull off a mustache. I'm going to ask the audience. <laughs> <laughs> there was you, a dodgy Halloween you can there. Pull off, you can pull off a beard, n never mind a mustache, well done. Um, <laughs> so tell a lay, a lay person regarding, you know, how do you balance the level of cell death and you know, cell growth. How do you how do you balance those two as you grow older, or is there a mechanism to do that, or is it just a natural death and growth cycle? So your cell has an inbuilt cycle, and in this there are certain checkpoints. So the first stage is DNA replication, and it will only do that if it's got enough components to make DNA, has enough energy to make DNA, and if the cell conditions are right. After that, there's a little gap phase, and the cell is just kind of getting itself ready. And then there's another checkpoint just before it divides in two. So if the cell doesn't have enough energy, then it has to go break down your fat stores, make energy, and then go back in, and then it'll be able to divide. But if the DNA in the cell might be damaged, then it can trigger various signaling pathways, which will cause the cell to be degraded instead of being replicated. So you only replicate your healthy cells rather than your unhealthy ones. Tim? You, you mentioned the immune system there. Maybe you could just explain how important that is in terms of cell growth and cell death mechanism. Okay. So there's a type of immune cell called neutrophils, and they're the first responders to any uh, infection. So you want to have a constant supply of these and a constant fresh supply of these. They only last a few hours anyway. Um, and once they attack a pathogen, they're degraded. So your body is constantly making new neutrophils and then degrading them, even if they're not used. And this kind of seems like a bit of a futile process, but it's very important to have a complete fresh set of neutrophils in your body so that just in case you do get an infection, they can respond straight away. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, so can I ask you, Ross, um, what do you hope to, to gain from your, your experiences in science communication? Um, so I think when a lot of people get into science, they don't get into it because of the technical details of it. In a lot of science, when you're studying at a college, it's just learning lists of this, learning this of that, learning different chemicals, different pathways. But unless you're able to relate that to a real world problem, then you're just learning information on a page. You're not really understanding the science. So science communication allows you to take that scientific knowledge and then apply it to real world problems. This talk was based on a Greek paradox. We've been talking about identity and things like this for three like for thousands and thousands of years. But now we know a bit more about the science. So if we can apply the knowledge that we have in science to philosophical problems or even just questions we have about life itself, then we'll be able to move forward from there. Thank you. Ross Murphy, everyone. So we arrive at our final act for this evening. Uh, Joanne Duffy's talk is called The Gene Genie. She's originally from County Meath. Uh, she's an adoptive Galwegian on the cusp of completing her BSc in microbiology. She has grand plans for a PhD working on the recombinant expression of barnacle glue. Yeah, you heard that right. Uh, she loves NASA. She managed NUI Galway's first science fair and talks about science every week on the radio for her show, Schrodinger's Chat, on Flirt FM 101.3. Her idols are Tim Minchin and Beyonce. She's hoping her talk will be flawless. Otherwise, she'll be calling a halo early tonight. If you like the talk, by the way, you should put a ring around it in your audience voting forums. Please don't lose those, by the way. They are irreplaceable. Sorry, too many Beyonce jokes. <laughs> Joanne Duffy's there just saying, say my name. I will, I will. <laughs> Joanne Duffy, everyone. <laughs> 10 a.m., the doctor's office. A needle pierces a baby's skin, and the baby lets out a piercing scream. His mother rubs his belly to comfort him, and inside his body are a team of trained assassins, raging killers, trying to eliminate the substance that has just been injected into him. They find specialist weapons that work against that substance, and they remember them. 
In the 1930s in America, the whooping cough killed a whooping quarter of a million children every year, but two women changed the face of the disease by developing the first vaccine against it. Grace Eldering and Pearl Kendrick killed whooping cough cells using formaldehyde and injected them into children in the community. They saw a marked reduction in the number of children who developed the disease, but this is not ideal for a number of reasons. Formaldehyde, it turns out, is quite bad for you. So science now goes one better. We're able to teach your immune system to develop those same specialist weapons without it ever seeing the real bad guy at all. All we need to do is show it something that identifies the bad guy. So we look through the genetic book of information provided by whooping cough. We find instructions for something on its surface and we hand those instructions to E. coli. Now, that might seem counterintuitive. E. coli gets a bad rap in the media for causing urinary tract infections and food poisoning, and we use it as a marker of fecal contamination of water. So what on earth are we doing using a poop bacteria to make vaccines? Well, E. coli reads the instructions we give it no matter what. So we give it some good quality red wine, we play it some Barry White, and we let them get it on. <laughs> And when they get it on, they make millions of the product we're interested in. We genetically engineer that product with a chemical luggage tag so we can retrieve it at the end and it's safe to inject into people. We have a biological assembly line, a chemical cell factory that's alive. So at 3 p.m., the baby goes down for his nap and he's still grumpy at having been poked with a needle. But inside his body, his immune system is already developing the weapons it needs. So when the real bad guy comes along with all of its dangerous weaponry, his immune system knows exactly what to do. <laughs> Well done, Joanne. Uh, well done, Joanne. It's a great topic to talk about since there's so much about vaccinations at the minute. Yeah. Now, you're talking to a very interested audience and you did an exceptionally good job at it. How do we get this message out to everybody else? Um, so I suppose vaccines are safe is the, is the message. Um, so there is a wealth of data to show that vaccines are safe. It's one of the most rigorously tested products that is ever introduced into the body. Um, it, it, it arguably undergoes more testing than any kind of drug because a drug theoretically is temporary. When you take a drug, the effects will wear off after a certain length of time. These molecules only have a certain half-life, they will dissipate. So even if somebody has an adverse reaction to a drug in a drug trial, it will go away. But the difference with vaccines is that you're teaching your body to respond to something. So the neutrophils that Ross was talking about, that's called the primary immune response. So that is, in, that is found all across the animal kingdom. But the adaptive immune response is unique to vertebrates. So the adaptive response is literally what I was describing. Your, your body literally finds weapons that specifically work against segments of amino acids that are six amino acids long, they're tiny. And there's an infinite number of combinations of those weapons. So it is, it is different to try and introduce those things, but because we're teaching your body to do something by itself, it's very important to get it right. So there's a wealth of data that shows the vaccines are safe, particularly uh, the whooping cough and infectious diseases. Joanne, uh, extremely interesting. Thank you for that. Can you just tell me a little bit about where you see yourself um, and taking this research? Okay, so uh, basically the, the theme for this talk came from some other work that my potential supervisor does. So um, I have, like Jonathan said, grand plans for a PhD. It's not exactly cemented yet, but I'm nearly there. <laughs> So uh, I have to get my undergrad exams out of the way first. So what I'll be working on and what I worked on in my first semester of final year is barnacle glue. So it's the same principle. Once something has a genetic instruction to be made, we can give that genetic instruction to any small organism, and Barry White on the red one, and they get it on. And when we have millions of them in something the size of your water bottle, the potential is just enormous. So Jared Wall, Dr. Jared Wall in NUI Galway makes antibodies this way. So um, that's kind of where the idea for, for this talk came from. But once, once there's a genetic instruction to make a protein, we can make it. All right, John Duffy, everyone. All right, it is time for our judges to retire and consider uh, all of the things that have happened before. 
Um, you've got about 15 to 20 minutes. I know it, 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 it's pretty difficult this year. Sometimes I have an inkling as to who might win. I have no idea. So uh, off you go. Uh, have some fun, and we'll see you in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, don't forget, folks, uh, there is an audience prize. So on your seats, you should have a sheet. We just want one tick or one X. I am Eamon McGuire, and I like to talk about science that's in the everyday, science that all of us can relate to. In particular, I love to talk about sexy science. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I know what people usually think whenever I say that. People say, sexy science, does that really work? Do those two words really go together? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that they do. Put up your hand if you've ever been in love. Most people are really awkward. There's a couple over there, one hand up, one hand down. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed for you. Um, so Vincent van Gogh once said that love is a mystery in a mystery. And I find that absolutely captivating and so romantic. And I wanted to find out what exactly was love. Could we pin it down? So I started asking people what love meant to them. Not many people could give me an answer. Um, my sister said, love is completeness. Um, I nearly vomited. And uh, <laughs> my best friend probably came up with the best answer. She said, love is almost like a socially acceptable form of insanity, a beautiful madness, and I kind of melted. Um, and I just thought that was absolutely lovely. And I am not the only person who's wanted to know this answer, because the most Googled question in 2012 was what is love. And I was hearing everyone's explanations, and they were all very romantic, and they were all very, very idealistic, but I wanted science, and I wanted facts. And through my exploration, I discovered that science splits love into three distinct stages. So join me on this journey of madness. We begin at stage one, lust. At puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body. We've got our estrogen and our testosterone. And from then on in, we are constantly on the prowl for someone to reproduce with. But how do we entice them? We flirt. Some of us better than others. <laughs> if you want to flirt with someone, make your first line a good one. Do not use my favorite one. People think you're calling them fat. <laughs> It takes your brain less than a second to decide if you're going to fancy someone or not. That is why the first chat up line is so, so important. And fear not for the less attract attractive amongst us, many in this room. Studies show, <laughs> <laughs> studies show that good flirting technique is actually more important than good looks. Thank God. So that is, that's, a real, that's a really good thing to take away from science, that you don't actually have to be that hot. You just have to pretend that you are. Animals aren't quite so tactful, like us, with unrequited lust. Take, for example, the male wolf spider. <laughs> if a male wolf spider approaches an unwilling female, she does not simply retreat. She eats him. <laughs> so don't feel too bad next time you're rejected, because seriously, it could be worse. Now, once we're on my favorite topic, which is animals mating, um, I'm going to share a song with you that, of course, I've written about this topic. Um, and the song is about the fact that most people think that animals just meet and mate. They don't take into consideration that they might actually fall in love like us humans. But this song is told from the point of view of two lustful animals who have recently, it sounds weirder uh, now when I say it out loud, who have recently met and fell, uh, instead of falling madly in love, they decided to just meet and mate and they decide to give their opinion on the human dating scene. This is an animal love song. <laughs> we both locked eyes across the green. I'd never such a handsome beaver <laughs> You caught my eye with your healthy signs And your tiffy smile I could tell that you were eager So I walked right up And I sniffed your foot And you smelled just like a tree I knew you were the one for me And you must have had a sexy mind Because you sniffed me from behind But this isn't art It's not seduction It's just simple reproduction He's 
said, well, I could say I love you, but I'm just following evolutionary trends. She said, well, I could say that I need you, but I just need you till this time of ovulation ends. But, 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 fever love, my fever love. Shortly after I'd written this song, I played it for my mom on FaceTime. And she said, please never, ever, ever play that song in public. <laughs> and I was like, mom, of course I won't. <laughs> then as we were mating, we saw two humans dating. They were kissing, holding hands, but both of them were wearing pants. And I could tell they were the age for fertilization of eggs. So why are they wasting all their time with dinner, nice kisses and wine? When they should be at it like the rabbits, they should rattle like the snakes, clean each other just like cats or use no hands like a T-Rex. They should be swinging like the monkeys, squealing like the pigs, or just doing it like us beavers on these leaves and worms and twigs. <laughs> so humans, next time, just say, hey, I like your DNA. <laughs> Do you want to set a date to come over and procreate? <laughs> he said, well, I could say I love you, but I'm just following evolutionary trends. She said, well, I could say that I need you, but I just need you till this time of ovulation ends. But, 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 fever love. I know everybody knows the tune this time, so I'm going to keep saying it. Everybody sing along, please. But, but. Now that we know that we are humans and we do actually fall in love with people, we need to think, what are we attracted to? Or in other words, who are we going to flirt with? So one of the things that we find really, really attractive is the color red. Millions of years ago, our ancestors developed this ability to see ripe red fruits amongst green leaves. And from then on in, red equaled reward. Now, we've got things like Coke and McDonald's trying to make themselves more appealing by being red. And even looking at someone wearing red can quicken the pulse and cause mass feelings of excitement. Calm down, guys. <laughs> Our lips evolved to become red to attract mates. In fact, men consistently rate women with plumper, redder lips as more attractive, which is why women will wear red lipstick and why men want us all to look like Angelina Jolie. There have been a few experiments looking at the impact of red on men in particular. One study in 2008, men openly said, yeah, if she's wearing red, I'll spend more money on her. And another study in 2012, men were shown to spend more money on dates whenever the waitresses were red and provide those waitresses with more tips than the waitresses who were wearing white. Another thing that can really spark our interest in someone is their scent. And I don't mean perfume scent, aftershave, body odor. I mean their natural scent. So we have got a group of genes called the MHC genes. And they control our immune system, and they also give us our natural scent. In a famous experiment, women overwhelmingly preferred the smell of t-shirts worn by men with different MHC genes to their own. Why would that happen? Well, if two people with different MHC genes and therefore different immune systems come together to produce a child, the child's immune system will have the best of both worlds so it can better fight disease. So in terms of genetics, opposites really do attract. So now we've flirted our way and fancied our way through stage one, the best stage. And we are now complete with stage one. And we can move together to stage two, romantic attraction. This is the stage where you're head over heels, madly in love with someone. You can't get enough of them. Um, you resort to stalking <coughs> on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. You just think that you're the modern day Romeo and Juliet, and no one will ever be in, as in love as the both of you. 
Yeah, see? <laughs> Our baby is like, yep. <laughs> um, never been heckled by a baby before. <laughs> People usually associate uh, love with the heart, but the real magic does happen in the brain. And there's several areas of the brain that were shown by scientists on an MRI to light up when people were madly in love. The, the first was an area called the caudate nucleus. So it helps us expect and detect rewards. Another area was something called the ventral tegmental area. And it acts nearly like a chemical making factory, and it shoots these little arrows laced with love drugs all through your vulnerable brains. These love drugs are serotonin blockers, adrenaline, dopamine, and oxytocin, and they can actually give us a natural high. They stimulate the same area of the brain as cocaine with similar side effects, like increased heart rate, obsessive thoughts, and ultimately, addiction. Put simply, we are chemically insane. Now, we humans aren't the only ones to suffer from these side effects. Some animals can feel them as well. <laughs> um, for example, if we look at seals, if we take the male seal, when a male seal is trying to woo a female seal, <laughs> when a male seal is trying to woo a female seal, he will lose over half his entire body weight just with the sheer effort. I wish that happened to me. <laughs> I was trying to move people. Um, the, a similar type thing happens with elephants, and it's again, it's the males. Whenever a male elephant is in the middle of elephant mating season, he gets so thin, frail, and exhausted from all the elephant relations that he has to go back to his herd for months just to recuperate and to get his strength back. So that is our stage two complete. Your brain cannot survive in a kind of blissful, drugged up state forever. It eventually has to sober up. So that sobering up takes us to stage three, attachment. And this is the point where you are in this relationship for the long haul. And your brain responds with a rush of something called oxytocin, which is the love hormone. It acts like the glue in a long-term relationship, keeping you together with that person long enough, scientifically, hopefully, to raise a family. And that's the happily ever after. As we all know, nothing ever goes wrong with relationships. <laughs> Ideally, your journey should end there, and you should kind of drive off into the sunset in your family Volvo with your 2.4 kids in the back. But that doesn't always happen. You know, we've got things like people who cheat on people, touchy subject. We've got relationship breakdown. We've got um, things like divorces. Um, and the scientific stages of love, one, two, three, it doesn't always happen that way. Some people are just really motivated by the lust stage, and they don't want to move on to stage three attachment. Some people get so addicted to that cocaine-like high of stage two that they want to experience that over and over again. You can't really experience that over and over again with the same person. But if you break up with that person and start a relationship with a new person, then start a relationship with a new person and keep going. The people who change their Facebook relationship statuses all the time, we would call them stage two junkies. <laughs> they need that cocaine-like high. Um, and it's not their fault, it's just chemicals. Um, and people can actually experience all three stages at the same time with different people. So you could be married and in a long-term relationship, which is stage three, attachment. At the same time, you could have a bit of a thing for someone at work and they really make your heart beat and they make your tummy feel funny, which is stage two, romantic attraction. But you might really lust after someone who gets the bus home with you. So you can experience all of them at the same time. The reason that everyone doesn't go through them in the same way is just because we're human and love is as diverse as the people who experience it. Now, after going through all that and talking about all the science of love, I feel like we're kind of close enough for me to share a little personal story about my experience, or lack of, with, <laughs> with love and with relationships. I kind of consider myself to be, you know, one, one of the lucky ones because I have actually met my soulmate. Oh. <laughs> and I have experienced love. Um, 
back home in Belfast, uh, we've got this really cute little kind of coffee shop. You probably don't have it here. It's called Starbucks. And, <laughs> and I actually fell madly in love with the barista in Starbucks. We had this whole thing going, you know, this whole chemistry, and we had our own personal jokes. You know, I would pay for my tea and they would spell my name wrong. And it was obviously so I would have to go up and get another one. So cute. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, the feeling wasn't mutual um, because they were married. Um, but like all good relationships, you know, we both got things from it. I got this song um, under restraining order. So <laughs> I am going to finish my talk today, and thank you all so much for listening, with my scientifically accurate love song. Right, normally this is the time where I uh, awkwardly try and fill some minutes, um, but luckily for the first time ever, we actually have the judges here on time, which is great news. So please welcome back our panel of judges. So uh, the prizes are, um, uh, the third prize is 200 euro voucher, the second prize is an iPad Pro, and the uh, winner wins 1,500 euro in cash. Also uh, gets to travel and represent Ireland in the Cheltenham final. Um, how was the judging process? Was there fighting? Was there bun throwing? A little bit of fighting. I know it was tough because I was trying to figure out who, who you would vote for and also who I would vote for. So we're going to do this um, in order and we're going to do, we'll start off uh, with the audience vote, which doesn't always match the winning vote. And tonight's uh, audience vote is... Deidre Robertson. <laughs> actually, actually, will you, uh, 
Zaten... Well done. All right, I took hold of it very close to my chest because I've, I've made the mistake before of not being very careful. So, uh, in third place, please put your hands together for Ross Murphy. <laughs> oh, yeah. In second place, our runner-up is Joanne Duffy. Well done. Thank you. All right, it's time to announce uh, this year's Fame Lab. Ireland winner. They'll go on to Cheltenham representing us. It's a fantastic weekend. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, I, know, I know you did because you agreed with the panel. It is Deirdre Robertson! <laughs> Do you all want to get up? Congratulations. Well done. You did brilliant. We're just going to get uh, the chair of our judging panel, Sarita, to say a few words. So I'm just going to talk about Ross first and foremost. Um, Ross, you taught me a lot um, in terms of the way you answered the questions. It was so clear. Um, the use of the prop was amazing, a uh, difficult topic and extremely well articulated. Joanne, uh, for what we all said, for a final year undergrad, Exceptional performance, great communication skills and understanding of the topic. Um, we really loved the Barry White, the red wine and the Gelan. <laughs> um, and Deirdre, what can we say? The way you combine the psychology with the traditional treatment and brought another way and another method, a, a way of looking at it, you brought it out of the box. You <coughs> made it an extremely interesting topic. Uh, control, alt, delete was a really good analogy and you demonstrated a fantastic understanding of the topic. Here, Thank here. you. Thanks, Rita. What a lovely night. I hope you had a good time. Did you enjoy yourselves? Woo! Wonderful. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our fantastic partners here, uh, which you see above me, too many to name. Of course, British Council, who organised Fame Lab and uh, Newstalk, who partner with them. I'm always very grateful to have that opportunity, and, and I'm very grateful to be here on stage and get to, to share tonight with you. Thank you so much to our Fame Lab contestants. <laughs> And we should also mention tonight was funded uh, in part by the Science Discover program. Thanks very much to the Science Gallery for hosting tonight. I hope you had a great time. Please do let people know about the Fame Lab competition. If you know someone who's interested in science, technology, engineering, or maths, get them to enter next year. It's a great opportunity, and everyone here will go on and do great things, I think, as a result of their experience here. So I wish them all the very best of luck. For me, I'll see you next Saturday at 12 p.m. on News Talk for Future Proof. Uh, <laughs> Final plug. Thanks so much. Have a great night. We'll see you next year. Well done. Thank you so much.